Saturday night on BBC One. Our summer season of Premiers on One continues. But first at 7.30, the National Lottery winning lines with the National Lottery Thunderball and Lottery Extra draws live. Then at 9, Richard Gere enters the red corner. I think I killed her. In a fight for his life. I'm innocent. He uncovers corruption at the highest level. I have the right to contact my embassy. But will he live to tell the tale? It can be more easy. If you confess your crime, I am not pleading guilty. Premieres on One, Saturday night on BBC One. Spend the summer with the Cazalettes. How many more coming, Mrs. Cripps? I've met his master decides to invite. As they reveal their dreams. I think you should stay a painter. Most other grown-ups can't agree with you. Their fears. I really don't feel up to another baby. And desires. You're going out with him, aren't you? What on earth are you talking about? Dr. Sherlock. Does Rupert know? The Cazalettes continues Friday at 9 on BBC One. A pioneering new treatment to help people with difficulty walking. Tomorrow's World with Signing starts the Deaf Zone on BBC One in just a moment. First on BBC One, a late night look at the weather with Michael Fish. Hello there. The heat wave has broken, or at least is in the process of breaking across most parts of the continent. But we have had some record temperatures in the process, not least of all in Spain, where they saw temperatures just recently, that's on Tuesday, of around about the 40 or even 42 degrees Celsius mark. And well-known places like Malaga have certainly been sweltering around about 40 degrees or so. And they weren't alone because across the road in Italy, in Naples, the temperature also way up on what we'd expect at the time of year. Now it has been a rather different scene in the British Isles. You'll recall we got to 33 degrees in Worcester. It all switched around during the, uh, the day because it was the west that got a lot cooler, whereas some eastern areas that were cool the day before, Skegness for instance, got to 25 degrees. We are, I think, going to see things changing for a time. We will find somewhat cooler weather. That doesn't mean to say it's going to be cool by any means, but somewhat cooler weather affecting much of Western Europe, including the British Isles. And then over the weekend, it looks as if much of Spain and France and indeed into Britain and Germany does get a good deal warmer again. But for the time being, with the somewhat cooler interlude, there are some outbreaks of rain, thundery rain at that, working their way through central and eastern parts of Europe, whereas the Mediterranean stays fine and dry. Thundery breakdown, as you might call it, came about as that area of low pressure moved across us. That'll head away, and then we're going to settle down into more or less two distinct weather types. For instance, the northwestern half of the country, close to this low pressure and loads of isobars, will keep rather windy and cloudy with rain from time to time. The southeastern half, close to the high pressure, will be by and large fine and dry and quite warm. Now, for the rest of the night, we've still got some thundery outbreaks in the Northern Isles and a curl of cloud and rain coming down into western Scotland and Northern Ireland. Also, some outbreaks of rain working their way across Wales, central and southern parts of England. In between, it's going to stay fine and dry everywhere, a cooler night than of late. In the morning, for central and southern areas, a good deal of clouds, some showery outbreaks of rain. Then we'll have a brighter interlude. Then we'll have some cloud across the north, still with some quite heavy bursts of rain. Now, that rain will pull away during the day. The showers will head on eastwards, one or two fairly heavy ones. But then as they move on, coming along behind will be somewhat brighter weather. The showers will turn quite scattered and much lighter. And then later on in the day, still across Northern Ireland and the far west, the cloud will thicken again with some further outbreaks of rain. Reasonably warm in most places, but a bit on the cool side in western Scotland. Pollen index still high. The season has several weeks to run as yet. And then when we move into Friday, we will find a weather system pretty active across the northwestern half of the country, bringing some outbreaks of rain, followed by brighter weather with showers. The southeast, though, stays fine and dry. In fact, I think we're going to have some reasonable temperatures at Wimbledon in the next few days, but always perhaps the chance of a shower or two, maybe a spot of rain late on Friday. But then into the weekend, as I said at the beginning, the southeastern part, fine and warm, with a good deal of sunshine, northwestern areas rather unsettled. Good night. Embroiled in a world of secrets and go-betweens. We were informing him that, unbeknownst to him, there was other talks taking place. The true story of politics at the highest level. The Prime Minister asked us quite explicitly, was this message authentic? And the little white lie which kick-started the peace process. I sent no message which in any way indicated that I was a mood of Republicans at that time. No party prejudice, no political spin. Endgame in Ireland, Sunday at 8 on BBC Two. Uh, I'm a sales rep, which means 
that my job is to speak to clients on the phone about uh, quantity and type of paper and whether we can supply it with them and whether they can pay for it. And I'm boring myself talking about it. Which is... The Office, brand new comedy from Monday, July the 9th on BBC Two. Searching for the truth behind the Bristol Heart Hospital baby scandal. Panorama on BBC One with signing in 35 minutes. And this is BBC One with Tomorrow's World. On Tomorrow's World well tonight, the new crime-busting surveillance camera thieves can't resist looking at. Thus, the elusive kakapo, the bird-brained inventions of the saving of endangered species. And when cold kills, the bodysuit that can safely warm victims of hypothermia. Hello, welcome to the future and coming face to face with criminals. Do you ever feel you're being watched? There's a good chance you are. The UK has more closed circuit cameras pointed at us than any other country in the world. But although lots of crimes are captured on camera, criminals may not be. They often deliberately avoid looking at security cameras so they can't be recognised. But a new CCTV system could make looking at the camera irresistible to criminals. CCTV, it's very easy to get round. This man knows everything about stealing. But he's not a thief, he's a store detective. The shoplifters don't worry about the cameras no more. To those in the know, keeping your face off the film is easy. I've seen cases of it where they've walked away because the film isn't 100% clear. Unless it's 100% clear, then it's useless. To the rescue comes this new CCTV camera. That's it, that tiny little eye down there which its makers claim will capture a full face image of you nearly every time. Now, it does this by emitting a sound through the loudspeaker here, which will attract your attention. It's not just any sound. It's white noise, broadband. It was the reaction of Malaysian primates to that noise that gave Deborah Withington the idea for a new camera. She noticed that broadband sound was the key to their survival. Let's take a crack of a twig, rustling of leaves. That could be a predator about to creep up on you. And they contain a multiple range of frequencies that we call broadband sound. Oh, that was clearly broadband. Look at the range of your dots on your meter there. That's right. And if you play a broadband sound, you can guarantee that people uh, will turn and look in the direction of that broadband sound. The way we react to a broadband sound is part of our survival system. Deep inside both human and animal brains is the superior colliculus, which alerts us when it hears certain noises. The noises it reacts to are not narrowband sounds with their tighter frequency range, but broadband ones, which give away their direction and make our heads turn towards them. So put a camera in a corridor with a loudspeaker beside it to make the sound. And with a narrowband sound, when people walk past the camera, they may hear the sound, but they won't know where it's coming from. But if it's a broadband noise, it'll cause us involuntarily to look towards the camera, because it's giving our brain enough information for us to pinpoint its source. Already, ambulance sirens are using broadband noise to make sure people notice them and get out of the way. What's more, Deborah has discovered that the more nervy you are, the more likely you are to react to the sound by looking in its direction. Here in this darkened room, six volunteers have agreed to be scared out of their wits in the interests of science. Scientific studies show that people about to embark on a crime are extremely anxious. Well, we're replicating that anxiety here by asking our volunteers to watch a horror movie. Now, what's the point of the film? What effect does it have? Well, it's a scary film, and what happens is their heart rate's going up. And we're sending them out at particular points in the film just as the tension's rising. Even in a relaxed state, most people look at the camera. 
But when people are hyped up, Deborah reckons absolutely no one can resist. Oh, he looked at the camera, didn't he? Absolutely, Straight. without a shadow of a doubt. No question. The sound is triggered by breaking a passive infrared beam, just as when you pass a security light. Supposing they know the camera's there? Oh, well, this is the last group that we're trying here. Now, we have told them, just before they watch the horror film, that there is a camera, there is sound, and to not respond to the sound when they hear it. Deborah is hoping to prove that even when criminals are aware of this trick, they still can't help but react. Oh, look, <laughs> try. it was quite funny, wasn't it? Yeah, he really did try ever so hard not to respond. Well, we're going to carry this experiment a stage further. Here at this supermarket, a crime is about to be committed, and Mick here is going to commit it. Now, Mick, I'm going to plant this bottle in the shop, and I'm going to ask you to steal it and try and get out of the shop without being detected, OK? OK. Let's have a look around, then. What we don't tell Mick is how we plan to catch him out. OK, Mick, have a good look round now. Case the joint. What do you reckon? I reckon it's easy. Feeling a bit nervous about it or not? No, not really. You reckon you're going to steal this bottle and get out of the shop without us detecting you? Yeah. All right, well, let's see what happens then. So I'm going to plant the bottle of wine here and the shop's cameras will follow Mick as he walks around the shop and with luck, that camera up there, the special one with a loudspeaker attached, will nail him. And I'm going to watch the whole thing on the television monitor at the back of the shop. He wasn't particularly tense, Deborah, I warn you, so you may not get that advantage you got with that horror Trust film me. and the others. <laughs> Trust me, he'll be tense. All know. right, all right. And here he comes. Here he comes. Look, he's, look. Yeah, he's covering his head. <laughs> covering his head up. Yeah, he's having a good scratch, but that means his head's no. down, so we're not catching Would his a camera head. identify him so far? No, not at all. Still not a full facial. Look at that. Absol he looks straight at the camera. Yeah, and he was absolutely caught. But he's I'm not sure he, th he knows it, because, look, he's still hiding his face. Now, you reckon you weren't detected, right? Yep. OK, let's run it. Here's, here's what happened. OK, here you are coming up to the bottle of wine. Look, you're caught. Now, Absolutely did you remember that happening? You looked straight at the camera. Oh, I remember hearing the noise. Ah. What did you think of that piece of technology, then, Mick? That is brilliant. I would not have said that you got me on camera. It's amazing. And the implication of that? You've got a conviction. The new noisy cameras are in development with a CCTV manufacturer and should be coming to a shop near you shortly. Now, believe it or not, an invention from the States to encourage us to have a healthy diet. Apparently, we should all eat five or more portions of fruit and veg every day, but Americans are not eating enough. So to encourage their nation to consume more, the US government have come up with this edible food wrap. Edible, but is it tasty? The wrap is made purely from fruit or veg. 100% no additives. So this one is strawberry. Like any other food wrap, it creates a barrier between food and air and stops your food from going off. So you can cover a half-eaten old bit of apple and on the inside, it isn't brown. I've scraped a bit off there so you can see it's quite fresh. But surely this cunning plan to get people to consume more vitamins will only work if it tastes good. It can be made out of all sorts of things. Look, broccoli <laughs> for savoury dishes, I suppose, carrots, and then there's the strawberry, which really does smell lovely. But how does it taste? I have the perfect guinea pig here in the studio, a man who really enjoys his food. Oh, dear. Peter, I'm not going to get you to taste that. <laughs> I'm going to get you to taste this. What? Now, obviously, it's a banana <laughs> wrapped in what flavour? I don't think I've ever seen anything so unappetising in my Just life. Just eat it. Oh. What flavour is oh. it wrapped in? Um. <laughs> Didn't like it. Licorice? No, peach. <laughs> okay, it's quite so disgusting. My piece of apple. This looks like chocolate. Well, have a taste. It also looks pretty disgusting. <laughs> it does look <laughs> disgusting, actually. Mmm. Mmm. That could be chocolate. No, it's not. It's strawberry. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm hopeless. So, tastes OK, tastes not so brilliant. But my favourite thing about this invention, though, is that it's environmentally friendly. The wrapping is simply eaten. 
<laughs> Do you remember that amazing eclipse in Cornwall in 1999? Well, tomorrow sees the first total eclipse since then. This time, the moon's shadow will be skimming across the southern part of Africa. So, sadly, we won't be able to see any of it here. But BBC Online will be streaming a special one-hour programme from Zambia starting at 1.30 in the afternoon. You can watch the whole event with almost guaranteed clear skies at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash eclipse. Loads of you visited our website after last week's show to take part in our memory challenge. Could you correctly identify the man in this footage? We asked you which, if any, of these four men it was. 83% of you wrongly identified one of these men. It was, in fact, none of the above. Now, a new treatment to help people who are long-term sufferers from diabetes. If you're one of the million and a half people in the UK with diabetes, you'll know the bind of daily insulin injections and the possibility of ending up with circulation problems. Which can result in extreme cases in losing a leg. But there's hope with a new operation. Vicky has been suffering from diabetes since she was 10. Poor circulation means she now has practically no blood in her left foot. It's cold to the touch, blue and lifeless. She's about to undergo an operation she hopes will save her leg and end a life of pain. Sometimes it can be um, a band of um, fire that is getting tighter and tighter. My hopes of the future are to be able to walk without any pain. Everything's ready. All the checks have been done. And um, any minute now, the operation will start and could last as long as four hours. She had infection on the other side. Saroj Das is the surgeon who's going to carry out this pioneering operation. He's going to cut into Vicky's abdomen to remove a piece of membrane which is rich in blood vessels from around the stomach. He'll transplant this membrane into her lower leg where the blood flow is blocked. By joining up the arteries and veins, he aims to stimulate the circulation and promote the growth of new blood vessels. The operation is well underway. We should warn you that you're about to see Vicky's stomach outside her body. What you can see now is the membrane called the omentum wrapped around the stomach. Part of this membrane will be transplanted into Vicky's leg to help her circulation. It's critical for Vicky that this operation is a success. If it fails, she faces losing a leg. That's the momentum there. That's right. You now have to take that, put that into the leg. Yes. And start the painstaking task of yeah. joining up the artery. This is what the arteries and veins in our legs look like. Now, with Vicky, the arteries here are so blocked that none of the blood can get down here to her foot. What they're doing as we speak is making an incision here inserting that healthy membrane which is rich in blood vessels in the hope that it will promote a healthier circulation. Vicky's operation is progressing well. The artery and vein in the omentum has just been attached to the artery and vein in her leg. Now, for the moment of truth, Mr. Das presses on Vicky's toe to see if blood is returning to her foot. I can see there is more blood flowing to the foot and I checked it just now that it is pink and it is getting pinker. All looks well now, but will it work long term? Vicky is the second person in the UK to have this operation. David Jones was the first. He also has diabetes and circulation problems and was faced with either having part of his leg amputated or gambling on this pioneering operation. It didn't take me that long to uh, consider which was the right option for me. And I'm pleased to say that it proved 100% successful. Surgeons are not sure exactly how the operation works, but evidence of its success can easily be seen. 
This is the x-ray of Mr. David Jones before operation. Below the knee, there are only a few blood vessels, and because these are diseased, at the level of the ankle, there's no blood flow at all. This is an x-ray two months after operation. There are many more blood vessels, and there's now blood flowing all the way to the foot. It worked for David, but will it work for Vicky? Two weeks after her operation, Saroj Das is paying her a visit. I'm very impressed, actually, to be honest with you. It looks good. Yeah, it's warm, pink. The important thing which I'm worried about is that your pain is better. My pain is absolutely wonderful. It's absolutely heaven. Uh -huh. We've been able to save your foot, your leg, and the way it is going. I have no objection that uh, you can go home. Oh! <laughs> oh, God! Oh, I feel marvellous. I feel absolutely marvellous. Oh, Vicky's had a few complications since then, so she's still in hospital. But her leg is getting better. If you or anyone you know want further information about diabetes, call the BBC Action Line on 08000 839 839 for organisations that can help. That's 08000 839 839. All calls are free and confidential. Still to come, on the night trail of one of the world's most elusive birds, how technology could save the kagapo. And the bodysuit saving off hypothermia at sea. Before New Zealand came into contact with the rest of the world, its birds led an idyllic existence. With no natural ground predators, some gradually lost the ability to fly. Ever since the first settlers arrived, bringing new threats with them, the flightless birds have been getting wiped out one by one. This is the kakapo. It's one of the few flightless survivors, and it's under serious threat. Its only natural form of defence Camouflage. Not very good when you smell as strong as a kakapo does. With fewer than 100 of them left in the world, the race is on to stop them dying out. Now they've been moved to predator-free islands, and conservationists are using technology to find ways of getting their numbers back up. Katie Knappman goes on a wildlife adventure to take a look. I'm at the southernmost tip of New Zealand being put through quarantine. A quick check for illegal contraband, that's grass seed and rats, and I'm set for the sub-Antarctic wilderness. I'm heading for Codfish Island. It's the home of the kakapo bird, which is one of the world's most endangered species, but it's also unique on a couple of other counts. It's the world's largest parrot, the only flightless one, and it's also nocturnal. There are only 62 of these birds left in the whole world, and half of them live on the island we're heading for. In 1983, Codfish Island was made a quarantined nature reserve. It became a sanctuary to 32 kakapo. The island's completely off limits to humans, apart from a handful of conservation workers who monitor the kakapo round the clock. We've been given permission to visit for just 24 hours to try to catch a rare glimpse of one of them. Joe Joyce runs the conservation programme on the island. As the kakapo don't wake up until it's dark, there's time for her to show us some of the homegrown technology being used to give the birds a fighting chance. So how did the kakapo come to be so endangered? Well, their yeah, form of defence is camouflage. Right. So if they're threatened, they just sit still. This is a typical kakapo nest. It's a dry hollow which is closed at the back. Now, eggs don't come every single year, so when they do, looking after them is like a military operation. To help them, they've come up with a nest kit. What you've got is an infrared spy camera and some infrared lights. They'll be shining on the nest. And there's also, across the nest, an infrared beam. The conservation workers set up camp and monitor the nest throughout the night. Today, Joe's testing the kit so it's ready to go at any time. The infrared camera's hooked up to a video entry phone monitor. When there's a predator or the female leaves the nest, the beam is broken and a doorbell is triggered in the tent. And when that goes off, what would you do? One person will watch what is happening from that point and the other person gets up, gets all their warm clothes on and goes to the actual nest itself. And they'll sit there until the female comes back again. This is the final part of the nest kit. It's like an electric blanket for the eggs. 
What you've got inside is like a whoopee cushion, a rubber cushion which is filled with wallpaper paste. There's an element inside there and there's a thermostat as well. That will regulate the temperature that the eggs are kept at. The next bit of kit lets Jo and her team make use of the bird's radio transmitters to check up on who's feeding and how much. It's thought that as a female kakapo puts on weight, her sex drive increases. OK, well, this is a feed station, and the birds have learnt to come and stand on this platform, and they'll feed with this lid resting on the back of their head. The birds have to stand on a set of scales to reach the food. These are connected to what's known as the snark. This consists of a radio receiver and a computer to collect information, which can then be analysed by the team. But at this station, there's a mystery. One of the female kakapo has been acting strangely. This belongs to a bird called Margaret Marie, and we're finding when we come to check her hopper the next day, it's nearly always pushed out of the stand and lying on the ground. Oh, wild. Well, tonight, for the first time, we're going to leave an infrared camera at this site and we're going to see a kakapo feeding and hopefully also get to the bottom of the mystery. We've got an hour before the kakapo start to wake up, which is just enough time to hike to the highest point of the island to have a look at another simple but effective invention, this time to help the males. But the weather's taking a turn for the worse. Ah, this is it, is it? The boombox. The boombox is no more than a car stereo, an amplifier and a timer. It switches on at night and plays booming. The mating call male kakapo used to attract females. Yeah, it's very low frequency, so it travels several kilometres away. Why do you actually need to have it? I mean, why do the males need more booming? Well, they're very, very competitive. So we want to try and make the males, if they think there's another male here that's booming better than them, they might start booming better as well. As it gets dark, the boombox isn't getting a response because the strong winds are carrying the sound away. Undeterred by the weather, we head off to search for the kakapo in earnest. I've been told that Sinbad, one of the hand-reared birds, will come if he hears voices. Well, we've got a signal. Oh, excellent. How far is he? Which direction is he? He's down off the slope, so... Oh, that's great. We'll find him. I hope so. Come on, man. Let's go. Let's go. We're frustratingly close. Sinbad can only be a few hundred metres from the path. But as we hike on through the night, the signal gets fainter. It seems it's not to be. The wind's now up to 80 knots, and it's likely that Sinbad simply can't hear us. The elusive Kakapo are living up to their reputation. He's been moving, but he's definitely he's moved further away. Finally, after seven hours, we decide to give up our search and wait until morning, in the hope that our infrared cameras have had more luck than we have. Tell me if you see anything, because you've seen these birds and oh, I yeah, haven't. Look, here she comes now. You can see Where? the glow of her eye. <laughs> look at that. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah, look the size goes. of her feet. She's like a big green chicken. Oh, look at that. She's jammed the lid so it's open. Normally, the birds will just, they'll just open the lid and they'll just feed with the lid resting on the back of their head. But she obviously doesn't like it, so she's developed her own way of, of getting around it. Oh, look, she's... Oh, oh, she's bumped it. <laughs> It's come right off the stand. Would that mean that you'd maybe change the way you design the hopper for Margaret Marie? Oh, I think so. At least you now know why there's always that destruction when you come in the morning to yeah, the site. we had no idea how she was doing it. So, success at last. Not only have we managed finally to spot a kakapo, we've solved the mystery of the damaged hopper. Although there's evidence of mating, sadly there have been no kakapo chicks born this year. But Jo and her team on Codfish Island are hopeful that with all the new kit, next year's breeding will be a success. Now, don't forget, it's almost time for tomorrow's World Live event to be held at Earl's Court in London. Packed with the latest gadgets, inventions and interactive exhibits, this year's event will be the most spectacular ever and promises to be an unforgettable day out. You'll be able to explore the future of music, transport, health and sport. Experience an intelligent home, a cyber world, a live laboratory and much more besides. The event lasts for five days and runs from Wednesday the 27th of June to Sunday the 1st of July. If you want to find out more, phone the information line on 08705 122 299. That's 08705 122 299. 299 calls are charged at the national rate. Now, landslides can be one of the most devastating forces of nature, destroying everything in their path. 
At their worst, hundreds of people can lose their lives, some of them literally buried alive. But a new system could reduce this threat by predicting when and where landslides will occur. Lindsay Fallow is in Hong Kong to investigate. The Hong Kong skyline has got to be one of the most spectacular in the world. But from up here, you can really see how space is at a premium. And having run out of flat earth, they've had to cut into the mountains to make room for more and more of these tall buildings. But imagine you live in one of these buildings and you know the mountain behind you.